Good morning. good morning. It is good to see you all this morning. Hope you're having a wonderful day so far. We want to welcome those of you who are joining us on Facebook this morning. We pray you're also having a blessed day. A few announcements to go through with you. Uh, you may notice that this coming week is a week of meetings uh, here at the church. Um, because in October, the middle of October, we have our annual church conference. That's the main meeting of the year where we set the budget and elect officers and do that kind of thing. So we have all these meetings we have to have to get ready for the church conference. So a uh, staff parish relations committee is tomorrow night at 6.30. Finance committee is on Tuesday at seven. The trustees are meeting on Wednesday at seven. And on Thursday, the lay leadership committee, also known as the nominating committee, uh, we'll be meeting at 7. So meetings every week uh, this week. I also want to remind you that at the end of next month uh, on Halloween, we'll be having the trunk or treat event for the children of our community. And uh, just, I know it's hard to believe, but hundreds and hundreds of kids uh, come here for that. And so we uh, would appreciate your help. You can help by praying for it. You can help by participating on the day. Bring your vehicle here, open up the trunk, decorate it, wear a costume maybe, uh, and hand out candy to the children of the community. Or you can help by uh, donating candy because we always need more than we've got. Uh, and so wrapped candy, no loose candy, but all wrapped candy. Uh, bring that to the church over the next uh, month or so, and uh, we'll be sure to have enough for the children who come. All right, that said, oh, and by the way, a word of thanks to Jessica. Um, somebody left an awful mess in front of the church um, earlier today, and Jessica cleaned it up so that none of you had to see it. Uh, so thank you for that. <laughs> and also a word of thanks to the president of our trustees, Randy, there. And uh, one of our friends from the thrift store, Bob, who are doing a lot of plumbing work over in Fellowship Hall, where we had some leaks that had shut down all of the water. Uh, and um, they've been working really hard at getting that fixed. And it's almost done. So thanks for that. All right. If you are able to, would you please stand for our call to worship?
Rejoice, people of God. Celebrate the life within you and Christ's presence in your midst. Rejoice, people of God. Bow your heads before the one who is our wisdom and strength. All right, our first hymn is Praise to the Lord the Almighty. We're going to be doing verses 1, 2, 4, and 5. Please be seated. By the way, on the uh, front of searching for a new music director, I had one nibble this week, but I didn't get a bite. Uh, so, but at least I had a nibble. All right, will you join me in prayer? Compassionate God, we thank you that you have come to us in Jesus Christ, sharing our common lot. As the shepherd seeks a lost sheep, you seek us when we wander. Finding us, you receive us with rejoicing. Since you have claimed us, fill us with your spirit, that we might be channels of your tender care for those who are brokenhearted or wandering. Amen. Exodus 14, 19 through 31. The angel of God who was going before the Israelite army moved and went behind them, and the pillar of cloud moved from in front of them and took its place behind them. It came between the army of Egypt and the army of Israel, and so the cloud was there with the darkness, and it lit up the night. One did not come near the other all night. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. The Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night. 
and turned the sea into dry land, and the waters were divided. The Israelites went into the sea on dry ground, the waters forming a wall for them on their right and on their left. The Egyptians pursued them and went into the sea after them, all of the Pharaoh's horses, chariots, and chariot drivers. At the morning watch, the Lord in the pillar of fire and cloud looked down upon the Egyptian army and threw the Egyptian army into panic. He clogged their chariot wheels so that they turned with difficulty. The Egyptians said, Let us flee from the Israelites, for the Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea, so that the water may come back upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots and chariot drivers. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and at dawn the sea returned to its normal depth. As the Egyptians fled before it, the Lord tossed the Egyptians into the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots and the chariot drivers. The entire army of Pharaoh that had followed them into the sea, not one of them remained. But the Israelites walked on dry ground through the sea, the waters forming a wall for them on their right and on the left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Israel saw the great work that the Lord did against the Egyptians. So the people feared the Lord and believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. All right, I think that Dawn put something in the box, yes? Okay. Well, let's see what it is. Oh, for a second I thought it might be a credit card. But it's not. It's an Ace Rewards card. $5 reward. All right. Uh, Ace is the hardware store, in case you're not sure. Um, lots of businesses do things like this. They, they offer rewards uh, as a way of um, building repeat business. When I was uh, in business, before I was a pastor a long time ago, I ran restaurants. And one of the things I kept training my employees to do was to do those things that would encourage repeat customers. That's where you make your money. That's how you build your business, by having repeat customers. And one way that you do that is by having little things like this. We used to give out cards to customers from time to time uh, for free sandwiches or free sodas or something like that as an inducement for them to come back. Um, sometimes we get things backwards in the church. And just generally as Christians, sometimes we get things backwards. We, um, we think that we do something because we'll get something good from it. Uh, and so uh, we, we do a, a good thing for somebody because we think maybe we'll get some sort of a, a reward for having done the good thing. Uh, but I would suggest to you, and you know this, doing the good thing is in and of itself a worthy thing to do without worrying about whether you get a reward for it, right? Um, rewards come, if they come, they ought to come unexpectedly to us. Um, don't do a good thing because you're anticipating a reward. Do the good thing because it's a good thing and because it's the right thing to do. If you get a reward, great. But if you don't, that's okay too because you've already done the good thing, the right thing. And that's how you and I build repeat business <laughs> in the church. That's what keeps people coming back. If they find a church where people do the right thing just because it's the right thing. So let's try and remember that. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Don. And now here's a, a video, a little bit about what we do as United Methodists. 
There was a moment when each of us chose to be UMC. We found a home in a local church, a place to share, pray, serve, learn, and grow. Our story joined with others and became part of a global connection. Together, we are making a difference. We see it in a congregation that is rebuilding their community after a natural disaster. We see it in the smiles of people who are searching for meaning and found it in the sanctuary of a United Methodist Church. We see it in a missionary dedicating her life to serving, supporting, and loving people others may forget. We see it in the millions of hearts that have been warmed in our Bible studies and vacation Bible schools. We see it in people tirelessly challenging the status quo and taking a stand for what's right. We see it in local churches who build trust and partnerships by nurturing faith, filling bellies, and providing care. Together, we are transforming the world. We are present in more than 100 countries, speaking many languages and representing diverse cultures. But our 43,000 local congregations all share a Wesleyan mission and ministry, a rich history, a dedication to service and outreach, and a passion for following Jesus through worship, prayer, and the study of Scripture. And together, more than 12 million members strong, we are the people of God called United Methodist. We are the church together. Let's continue to be UMC. I bet you didn't know that there were 43,000 United Methodist churches in the world. Yeah. Um, the other day, I was at a district clergy meeting with our, our district superintendent and the clergy of the Southwest District. And while the content of the meetings themselves are not tremendously exciting, uh, what's really nice about those meetings is getting time to spend a few hours with the other clergy of our district and listening to them telling the stories about what's going on in their churches and being able to share what's going on here. And it's good to know uh, all the things that are happening in the world because our churches are here. Let's stand and sing number 558, if you're able.
you kept up with that pretty well. Have a seat. Matthew eighteen twenty one through 35. Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, Not seven times, but I tell you, seventy-seven times. For this reason the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him, and as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold together with his wife and children and all his possessions, and payment to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denai. And seizing him by the throat, he said, Pay what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, I will pay you. But he refused. Then he went and threw him into prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he should pay his entire debt. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother and sister from the heart. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, I have mentioned to you before that uh, the, the study of numbers in the Bible is an interesting one. Uh, as you read through the scriptures, you can hardly help but notice that certain numbers keep cropping up. Uh, for example, uh, the number 40, uh, be 40 for a couple of examples, uh, the, the number of days of Noah's flood, uh, or... Uh, in the Exodus, the 40 years of wandering in the desert, or Jesus' 40 days of temptation in the wilderness. The number 12 comes up quite a bit. Uh, we see the 12 tribes of Israel, and that's based on the 12 uh, sons of Jacob. Uh, we get the 12 disciples of Jesus. Uh, the number seven, though, is, is one of the more important ones. We have the seven days of creation, uh, we have the seven uh, associated with the festival of Pentecost. Pentecost is a week of weeks, so seven times seven plus Easter, that's 50 days, Pentecost. And so uh, we have numbers all over the scriptures that have particular meanings. So when Peter asks Jesus about forgiving another person in verse 21, he says, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times. Jesus gives him an answer that he's not anticipating. Uh, and, and Jesus says, and by the way, the answer is different depending on which Greek uh, text you look at. Uh, it's either 70 times seven, which is 490 times, or the text could also say 77. It really doesn't matter um, which of those is uh, accurate uh, because those are not meant to be literal numbers in any case. Uh, there's no instruction here to keep a kind of a tally sheet um, that uh, keeps track of how many times you forgive someone. Uh, if you try to take that instruction literally uh, and apply a number to it, then you've missed the point. 
Um, forgiveness doesn't keep a ledger sheet. That's the point. Forgiveness doesn't keep a ledger sheet. Forgiveness is beyond calculating. Um, we have a parable that Jesus tells in response to Peter's question. And so he says that a kingdom, the kingdom of heaven is like this. And so the king goes to settle his accounts with his slaves, and one of the slaves owed 10,000 talents. Now, 10,000 talents, that is more than any slave could ever possibly hope to pay back. It equals 150 years of a laborer's wages. So there was no hope that that slave could ever pay back the amount that he owed. Uh, and at first, the king ordered him to be sold along with his wife and his children and all of his possessions. But the man begged for mercy and pleaded for patience. And the king was moved with compassion and forgave him his debts. But then the second part of the parable, uh, this same man who had just been forgiven a massive debt met a fellow slave who owed him only a hundred denarii, just one day's wages. And he seized the man by the throat and told him to pay what he owed. And when that man pleaded for mercy, his fellow slave had him thrown into prison. And then we get to the third part of the story that uh, is when the king heard about that, he was angry. He should have given mercy to his fellow slave just as he had received mercy from the king. And so he was punished, not for the debt that he owed, but for his unwillingness to forgive the debt of another. That was the issue. And so uh, we come to verse 35 again. And it says, so my heavenly father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Notice where that is. It's not on the ledger sheet. It's not on an account balance. It has to do with your heart. We've all heard people say, and maybe you have said from time to time, I can forgive, but I can't forget. Oh, I know what you mean about that, but <laughs> you knew there was a but coming, right? Yeah. Um, it's not really forgiven. Um, because it, it's not about the intellectual knowledge of what has happened. It's not about that. Nobody's asking you to wipe a memory from your mind. That's going to stay there probably. But the pain of it, the hurt of it, the anger of it, the need to hold it against the other person, that is what has to go. That's what has to disappear. And if that remains, then you've not really forgiven. Now, we say the Lord's Prayer almost every week. We're going to say it again in a little bit. And, of course, a part of that prayer, you know it, is forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And those are really important words. That's an important part of the Lord's Prayer. And the extent to which we really mean them is crucial to our lives of faith. And evidence of how much we are or, or not citizens of the kingdom of heaven. And so you need to check with yourself, how do you say the Lord's Prayer? When we say it in church, are you just repeating words, mumbling them out until you get to the end without really thinking about what you're saying? Or are you really conscious of what you're saying when you say it? Forgive us as we have forgiven. See, forgiveness has less to do with the other person than it has to do with you. Of course it means something to the person 
you have forgiven. It might be a relief to them to know that you have forgiven them. It might ease their burden a little bit to know that you have forgiven them. But it's not about them. It means more to you and to your spiritual well-being to be a forgiving person. Because if you don't forgive, if you're a person who withholds forgiveness, eventually you're going to become hard and cold and brittle and angry. You become a person who misses so much of the goodness and the beauty of life and of other people because you're too concerned with how much people have hurt you. You're too concerned with keeping score. You're too concerned with maybe getting retribution on somebody else for something they said or done. Forgiveness. Look at the word. It begins with the prefix for. That should tell us something about it. It's something that you give before. In other words, it doesn't require the repentance of the other person. If, we had, if God had waited for Jesus to die on the cross until you and I had come begging for forgiveness, it wouldn't have happened yet. God did it first. God forgave our sin in Jesus' name. We're going to sing those words in a little bit. You and I, as Wesleyan Methodists, at least most of us are, we understand something, maybe you don't know the words precisely, but we understand something about what John Wesley called prevenient grace. That is the grace that goes before. It's the grace that goes before asking. It's the grace that goes before awareness of need. God offers his grace to us before we ever, ever ask for it or even know that we need to ask for it. It is prevenient grace. And forgiveness is like that. You don't have to wait for somebody to apologize or repent before you forgive them. It's a matter of grace and mercy. Here's a picture. There it is. On the night of September the 15th of 1941, which is unbelievably 82 years ago now, the Germans bombed the city of Coventry. It was part of the blitzkrieg that Germany waged upon uh, England during the early parts of the war. Uh, the morning after the bombing, the people awoke to see that their church that had stood there for a thousand years, a thousand years, it had taken a direct hit by the Nazi bombing and all of the roof was gone and most of the church was gone. What still stood was some of the stone walls. The people of the church walked through the ruins of the building that morning and they found two timbers lying in a heap, charred by the fire and yet laying on top of each other like a cross. And so they took those two beams and they constructed a cross and they put it on the altar up at the front of the church and behind it on the wall it says, Father, forgive. Now the picture that you see there, that's, that's not the original church uh, cross. Uh, those have been put in the museum that is in the new part of the, uh, the cathedral. So this is a recreation, but the, the meaning is still the same. The people of that church didn't hold the destruction of their church against 
the Germans. And right after the war, in fact, Coventry became a sister city with the city of Odessa in Germany. Because they understood something about forgiveness. Forgiveness is the initiative of the one who has been wronged. You take the first step in the process of forgiveness. It's a good thing that God forgives us and that God has already done what needed to be done in order that our sins might be forgiven. Jesus already died on a cross for the forgiveness of our sins. And if anybody had the right to hold somebody else's behavior against them, it was Jesus. He had been accused and held in prison and tortured and then crucified for having done nothing, nothing wrong. And yet as he was nailed to that cross and as he was about to die, he asked for the forgiveness, for God to forgive the people who had done that thing to him. Forgiveness is an expression of the divine. It's not the fruit of reconciliation. It's the other way around. Remember what I was talking about with these cards? We get it backwards sometimes. People don't apologize to you and then you forgive them. You forgive them and then maybe they'll apologize and maybe they won't. That doesn't matter. You've already done the good thing, the right thing by forgiving them. And as you do that, it relieves you of a heavy burden. That's what forgiving others does. It doesn't forgive, it, it doesn't release them of any kind of burden. Maybe it will. Maybe in their own hearts and minds that'll relieve them of some burden. But the main thing is that it relieves you of the burden of anger and hurt and whatever else it is that you're carrying around inside of you. And that makes reconciliation possible. Once you've forgiven somebody, then you can be reconciled to them. Unfortunately, some of us live more like the one that we call the unmerciful slave. We want God to forgive us for a debt that we can never repay because how could we repay God for what Jesus has done for us? And yet, sometimes we're unwilling to be gracious and merciful toward others who have wronged us. I've said this to many groups in churches over the years. It occurred to me again in a situation last week. We want mercy for ourselves, but we want justice for others. Right? We want forgiveness for ourselves, but we want others to get what they deserve. That's not how God wants us to live. We're willing to throw others into pr the prison of the unforgiven, many times over small matters. And, and because we're willing to do that, we hurt them, yeah, but we hurt ourselves more. The unforgiving person will eventually not only be estranged from the people around them, they'll also be estranged from God. It's kind of the reverse of the great commandment. You remember the great commandment, love God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Well, if you're not willing to be forgiving, you're going to stop loving certain neighbors. And after a while, that number is going to grow. And as that number grows, your estrangement from God will also grow. And so we say, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. If we want forgiveness from God. 
we have to be willing to forgive. If we want mercy, we must be merciful. If we desire compassion, we must be compassionate. If we want to be a part of God's kingdom, we have to be willing to extend that invitation to everyone else as well, even the person who has wronged us. Because that's an invitation that has no strings attached. And it's an invitation that comes in an envelope of grace. Amen. Today, to affirm our faith, we're going to be using the modern affirmation. In the hymnal, it's number 885. If you're able to, would you please stand? Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is the one true church, apostolic and universal, whose holy faith let us now declare. We believe in God the Father, infinite in wisdom, power, and love, whose mercy is over all his works, and whose will is ever directed to his children's good. We believe in Jesus Christ, Son of God and Son of Man, the gift of the Father's unfailing grace, the ground of our hope, and the promise of our deliverance from sin and death. We believe in the Holy Spirit as the divine presence in our lives, whereby we are kept in perpetual remembrance of the truth of Christ and find strength and help in time of need. We believe that this faith should manifest itself in the service of love as set forth in the example of our blessed Lord, to the end that the kingdom of God may come upon the earth. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to Please be seated. As we turn to God in prayer, there are a few things I wanted to lift up to you. Uh, of course, all of the folks whose names are on our prayer concerns list. Uh, but also, let's keep Joyce Pears uh, in mind. Joyce had knee replacement surgery this week, and it went well, uh, but uh, it's not easy recovering from knee replacement surgery, so let's keep Joyce in our prayers. Um, also, uh, some folks who might be known to a couple of you, Dot and Fred LaRue. Uh, Dot comes into our thrift store uh, semi-regularly. Uh, she's now in ICU, and so we've been asked to pray for her and for Fred. Um, uh, we've also been asked to pray for uh, one, one of the uh, people from the community who helps us in the thrift store, uh, Ida, uh, has a son. Who, is, uh, who has uh, liver failure going on. So we want to pray for him. I don't know what his name is, but let's just pray for Ida's son. Um, and then uh, we also need to pray for the people of Libya. We, we, see, here's a case where uh, we might have some bad feelings about Libya because of what Muammar Gaddafi used to be up to, and, uh, but the people of Libya... Um, are now suffering. They had those catastrophic floods. And somewhere in the neighborhood, this is mind-boggling, but somewhere in the neighborhood of 11,000 people have died uh, because of those floods. And they still haven't uh, accounted for everybody. So let's keep the people of Libya in mind. All right, uh, our prayer chorus.
God, as we think about forgiveness, we are, we are humbled. We are humbled by the grace that you offered by the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross and how he did that, knowing that some of us would ignore it, knowing that we wouldn't appreciate it and some of us take it for granted. But oh God, help us to be the people who ponder it, who take it seriously and who are thankful that you have forgiven us in Christ and that all we need to do is to avail ourselves of that prevenient grace, that which draws us to your presence. We pray, O oh God, you would help us to forgive the people in our lives who annoy us, who irritate us, uh, with whom we're angry, maybe from whom we're estranged. Well, they may, might not receive our forgiveness. They might not care for it. They might not accept it. But help us to remember that that's not the point. The point is that our hearts are made pure. We, we make room in our hearts for you when we rid them of the anger that we keep. And so help us, O oh God, to be forgiving. We pray you'll be with all of those people whose names are on our prayer concerns list. We know that you know what they need. We pray for Dot, who's in the hospital. Uh, we pray you will be with her, that she knows that you are with her, with her husband, Fred, as he worries about her. Be with Ida's son as he goes through this difficult time of having liver failure and being treated for that. We pray that you be with him, be with Ida. Surround them both with your love and your care. Be with Joyce as she recovers from knee replacement surgery. Help her to have a good recovery and good rehab. And, oh God, we pray for the people of Libya. We pray for all of the families of those people who have lost loved ones and who still don't know where some of their loved ones are. Surround them with your love and care. Be with world rescue operations that are going there in, in order to help save people's lives and help and find ways to rebuild their communities. We ask, oh God, for your blessings upon each of them. Be with my daughter Leslie and her husband Dan as they now begin life on Guam. Uh, help them to get used to living there and being so far away. Keep them safe for these next three years. Oh God, all of these things we pray in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. All right, I, I didn't mention beforehand, uh, most of you know this already, my, my daughter Leslie and her husband Dan. Dan is in the Navy, and he's now been assigned uh, to three years in Guam in the South Pacific. So uh, it took them two days to get there. They flew from Virginia to Chicago, Chicago to Seattle, Seattle to Anchorage, and then Anchorage to Guam. So, uh, But they're doing okay, and now they're beginning to get used to their new situation. So that's what that was about. Our ushers will wait upon you now to receive your gifts, tithes, and offerings. I bring an offering of worship to my King. No one on earth deserves the praise is that Jesus, may you receive. 
the honor that you're due. Oh Lord, I bring an offering to you. Oh Lord, I bring an offering to you. Oh Lord, I bring an offering to you. pray. Generous God, you have given so much to us in love and joy. Every good thing in our life reflects your caring. Even in the giving of our offerings, we have tried to give our best, but know we could do more. In the world where forgiveness has become a rare commodity, it is often an asset we hold back to maintain power over one another. Help us to hear the teaching of Jesus in the generosity of forgiveness. May we learn to give that to others with wild extravagance. We pray in Christ's name, who gave all. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 389. service is over. Now may God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit bless, preserve, and keep you this day, this week, and forevermore unto eternal and everlasting life. Amen. <laughs>